season of Lent, a season in which we are encouraged as individuals to evaluate, to think through, to self-examine our own faith uh, and what and how that's being lived out in our lives. But there is also a place in this season of the year and in this season of the Christian journey for us to do some corporate self-examination. Us. What are we doing and why are we doing it? The temple that we read about in the text was a complex institution in Jesus' day. Many things going on and and if you've been in Sunday school any part of your life, you've had several lessons on the temple and things that go on there. But at its heart, the temple in Jerusalem was God's permanent dwelling place for those of God's people, a sign of the promise that God had made to them. The sacrificial rites uh, that we have heard about and, and we'll hear the, the doves and the donkey and the cattle and, and the sheep and all of those things were administered according to the Bible. They were doing church as the old scriptures had indicated. And Jews from everywhere, remember now, this is after the exile. And so many of those Jews never returned home to live, but they would come back at particular times in the years for these festivals, and especially Passover. So the temple was a significant symbol that bound up Jews to their identity together. It was a holy place, a place where human life and divine presence met. But evidently, somewhere along the way, something changed. On this particular day, Jesus enters the temple, not his first time. But he finds what one would expect during a pilgrimage to be going on. Just like anyone who's been in church typically over the last 20 or 30 years steps into ours and there's some familiar things that they go, oh yeah, okay, I see we're singing some, I see we're reading some scriptures, I see people are gathering, I see, oops, I sat in somebody's seat and they told me to get up. You know, there's all those kinds of things. The vital trades are in place for the necessary exchange of the monies and the animals and the grains for the required Sacrifices. Nothing is out of order at this point. That is, until Jesus makes a scene. This word tells us that he grabs a whip and he starts disrupting everything, turning over tables, running animals out, literally raising his voice very loudly and telling people to get out. And here in John... John has Jesus speak different words than the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There, the words, we know them somewhat by heart, you have made my house a house, a den of thieves. But not here. Jesus speaks different words as John records them. Here he says, my house is not a market place. I don't doubt that there was not corruption. They were human beings. We corrupt things. That's part of our nature. But Jesus seems to be concerned in the Gospel of John with something other than just the corruption. He seems to be concerned that the business of church has replaced the purpose of God's church. And so after all these years, I wonder again, does the question still need to be asked? In our efforts to keep attendance up and the coffers full, are we turning the church of God into a market place? I had one friend way back in my life, just kidding, I had three. But this friend and I had worked together to do a lot of recreation uh, events uh, in several different states uh, for uh, young people in particular. He was very good at what he did and it was a privilege for me to work with him. Uh, We had a good time putting together large events for state camps and those kinds of things. And he was a large man, I mean really 
big guy. He called me one day and he said, Stan, I, uh, I have the opportunity to go to Nashville to begin working in the church recreation department, which was then called of the Baptist Sunday School Board. That is now Lifeway. And by the way, the church rec department's not there anymore. But then it was a, it was a wonderful, exciting place. It did a lot of camps and a lot of things. And he was really excited. I could hear it in his voice. And I felt excited for him. He was the kind of individual who was so excited about going and taking recreation as a way to reach people for Jesus. That was his heart, and he did it well. It was about a year after he had been there, not quite a year. I had an education conference at the Baptist Sunday School Board, and so I was there. I was hoping to run into him, and I did. I ran into him in the hallway. We greeted each other. We kind of asked about our families. We checked in with each other, and I said, well, man, how is it going? Now, understand... Big guy, gregarious, you know, just he walks into a room and just immediately everybody knows that he's there. He's just a wonderful guy. But I kid you not, I, asked, I said, how's it going? His whole countenance shrunk. Here's a guy about six foot three in both directions. Huge guy. And he almost shrank down to the size of a small child. He said, Stan... I thought I had come here to help people learn how to reach other people for Jesus through recreation. But I've discovered we spend all of our time and all of our energy creating new things to sell to churches. And he said, I can't stay here much longer because it's simply about selling I have never forgotten that and I wonder still today if that is not something that is happening all across the place you remember that old church camp song in fact we sang it they'll know we are Christians by our love when did that not be when was that not sufficient enough it seems today that maybe the song we would be better off singing is they'll know we are Christians by our mug or our Bible cover or our t-shirt or our jewelry or our wall decor or our bumper sticker or any of the other thousands of items that one can purchase to say, I'm a believer. There's a fine line here. Those things are fine in their place. But when somebody begins to say, I'm not sure you're a believer, you're not using the right words. Wow. I don't really know if you're interested in this because I don't ever see you wearing something or carrying something. You see, external religion, things that are concerned without here will always be compulsively obsessed with prestige and privilege and power. Micah reminds us in that Old Testament text. In fact, not only just Micah or Amos, which we're studying right now, a series on the minor prophets, and you can pick any of the minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament. And one of their key elements is, folks, you're getting the cart before the horse. You're getting the purpose lost in what you're doing. Oh, you're doing great worship. Your style of worship is fabulous. But God's not pleased with your heart. You're doing great programs. But you're excluding people because of some of the things that you're doing. You see... The minor prophets and Jesus keep reminding us it's about how we are changed on the inside and how that plays out in our daily lives. They will know us by our love. I've said it before, but let me ask you again. For restaurant workers, for a lot of them, what is the worst meal and day of the week? Sunday lunch. 
It just is. And they shall know us by our Bible covers, by our church clothes, by our bulletins. They know us by how we act, what we say, and what we do. Question. These buildings that we call First Baptist Church, whose are they? Whose are they? The programs that we do, whose are they? I hope your silence is only because it's early. We have been entrusted by God Almighty with these buildings, with these ministries. All of this is God. When we keep this central, then church becomes what it was meant to be, both in Jesus' day and ours. It becomes a training ground for our life back out in the world. It is where we find encouragement and nourishment and strength, as George was reminding us, to go back to our main mission. What does Jesus say at the end of Matthew? Go ye therefore to the local pew and sit down. What does he say? Go ye therefore to all nations. Our faith is a moving faith. It is outside of here. Church is the place where we are reminded that Jesus is the presence and purpose of God. Jesus alone is the best understanding of God, the clearest interpreter of Scripture, the only person to follow. Again, you can put everything and anything out there and listen to to good uh, scholars and to each other, but in the end, we must listen to the words of Jesus and follow those words or we have stopped being a church. Because the church is the body of Christ in the world. It's really pretty simple why we come to church. We're the body of Christ. And we come here to learn these things. First of all, to love God. When we were singing that song, Better is one day in your house than thousands elsewhere. And I thought, how many thousands are elsewhere today? Folks, we're not communicating very well, are we? I don't know, Tom, if it's still the same, but I know in Virginia we did a study there. On any given Sunday, if everybody who was a part of any church, all denominations, if everybody was in church in a local, in in our county or there, There was still 75 to 80 percent of the county that were not in church. We don't come because of guilt. We don't come to check it off. We come to love God and to learn to love others and to learn to be inclusive, not exclusive. My house shall be a prayer of house for all. And when Jesus is hanging on the cross in a few weeks, we're going to hear Jesus say, Father, forgive just those who come to the temple and to the church and who are trying to be good Christians. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive all of them. Even those who put me up here. And you know what that means for us? 
even those who have hurt us. Those with whom we are afraid. Those we don't understand. Those we're not sure what's going on. God says, this is my house. Bring them in that I might meet them. And I will take care of your needs. Ultimately, we come to church to learn to die. I've often thought, I've often thought of putting that out here on our church side. Join us in church Sunday and learn to die. You think our parking lot would be full? My guess is some of you would not be here. Isn't that what Jesus said about his place? Are we focused fully on God and the way of the cross? Or are we trying to take matters into our own hands by gussing up the gospel, and dressing it up really nice and spinning and creating the latest exciting faith experience that you too will want to buy? And if you come now, you get a special deal. It's a fine line. I understand it. But today, Jesus says, be careful that you are not turning my church into a marketplace because it is indeed a holy place and a holy God has settled in upon us and a holy God today is forgiving you your sins and calling you to go back out there And be his presence, be his purpose, be his voice, be his love. For it was Jesus who said, if the right t-shirt is worn, all men will come to me. If the right program is put in place, all men will come. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, in your life and in mine, may it be so. Lord, we come this day giving thanks. We come this day grateful. Grateful indeed. That we live in a land that still allows us to make a choice about worship. Thank you, God, for the large number of churches and gathered congregations. Thank you for the setting aside of the schedule to just pause and stop and be reminded. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And so we ask for forgiveness. And it seems there are a thousand other places we would rather be. And then when we're here, God, we just seem to pick apart your church. We get focused on the wrong things. So one, help us to do better what we do here. Because we're doing it for you. Break our hearts first, God. Remind us that all of our lives will stand before you. And help us to put things in perspective and prioritize rightly. This is your church. We thank you for letting us be a part of it. Now, convict us and challenge us where in our own lives and in the life of this congregation we need to begin to make some adjustments that your church 
might be a shining beacon in this community for those who are lost and lonely and hurting and maybe have hurt us. You take care of our hurts that we can be your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you today to respond to this God who has graciously placed these buildings in this place.